Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just start talking now. Um, you can pay attention or not. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Ted Brown. Uh, I make video games doing this for about 10 years. Um, I started out as a designer uh, in LA working on uh, games like Gun uh, and Tony Hawk. I moved to Eugene, Oregon. Worked on uh, Tomb Raider and a few of the games. Um, I am now an engineer. Uh, working on Epic Skater, which is a mobile game, get download. Uh, I'm working on a VR therapy program with Pipeworks in Eugene. Um, I helped start a game community uh, called Bitforced, and uh, I'm also the director of Indie Game Con in Eugene. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur, um, so I work four days a week uh, on, as an engineer, and then two days a week, Friday and Saturday, uh, as an entrepreneur on my own game. Um, and then, you know, husband, father. I almost did put martial artist, but I, I'm not taking two different martial arts at the same time. I figured I'm just add her at the end, so I'm well balanced. Um, <laughs> this is my project. Um, I'd be remiss not to, not to plug it. Um, we are having a Kickstarter uh, September 1st, um, so those of you who could just on Twitter or, you know, whatever. Um, also, if you have a game, um, Indie Game Con is November. We're going to be at, uh, hosted by Eugene Comic Con. Um, they had 10,000 people come last year, and so we were super excited uh, to be hosted by them, and so we thought we should give some games good exposure. Um, so definitely, uh, it's free to apply, um, and so if you're interested, if that looks good to you, please uh, talk about that. Um, so here's the, here's the, the, the plan real quick. Um, core philosophy behind this talk, um, so heuristics you can use to help uh, drive the development of your game. Take a quick break, um, just speak just to the concept of that stuff, so again, because the next part is pretty dry. Um, it's critical, but dry. And then this is the, the fun stuff where we can kind of dive, in, dive into more of the personal, uh, yeah, I guess, testimony. I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out the balance here between the, the secular and divine. Um, okay, so, yeah. We're here because uh, we, care, we want games uh, to be our business. Um, and that is, uh, that is a, a, a nice thought. Um, so this is my favorite quote, I think, of all time. Um, it's from our game studio. Start with $10 million. There's no finer way to uh, burn a pile of green cash. Um, and there are many reasons for this. The first is that games, it's just, it's just hard. Um, it, is, it is hard to make money uh, doing games. I'm not trying to be, um, I'm not trying to get you guys down. So I want you all to be honest with yourself. This is a tough business. Um, I checked 30 games released on Steam yesterday, uh, not counting DLC. Um, the uh, average number of apps downloaded on phones uh, fell to less than zero, oh, sorry, yeah, less than one per month. So an average of zero apps are downloaded by users every month on their phones. Um, while over several hundred are released per day. It's a, it's a tough market. Um, so the thing is, this isn't, odd or unique to us. Um, most businesses, after five years, are down the drain. Sorry. Um, and so, don't feel like um, you are uh, taking uh, an extreme risk just by doing games. Does that make sense? Like, don't feel like you, you have done uh, yourself or your family a disservice by choosing to make games your business. What I'm saying is, business is hard. Uh, it needs to be respected. So, one thing that I often do, um, and again, I, I grew up reading fables um, and, and you know, Jesus just looked at parables. And I often look to um, other stories for uh, insights and cr to basically cross train, basically. And if you look at other people in the dis digital realm, right, who they create content and they sell it, you know, look, look at the people who, who make it. books, who authors, bands, some musicians, movies. Now, and all of these are hard businesses too. These have the, they have the same problems that we do. They have something they want to say, um, they need to find an audience to say it to, and they need to sell it to them for money so they can keep doing it and do it again. Um, but what's, what's missing from this, this, these numbers here, right? This is, this is what, this, this is the product, but it's missing the people behind the scenes, right? Like the, the people who, who are in the band, they've got a, a road manager. They have, they have a marketing guy. They have a producer who helps produce their, their sound. They have the sound guy, right? Books have, have you know, a community manager to help gin up you know, uh, 
uh, interest in their books. The movies have you know guys who are setting up screenings all across the country, right? There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I think as game developers we tend to overlook. I think a lot of us are so focused on this thing that excites us, it makes us alive, that we forget that if you're doing it as a business, you have to approach it with a different outlook. And these are just some of the things um, that I do. And, so, and again, in my work uh, in Eugene, I try to convey the fact that this product development and this business development, they're two sides of the same coin, right? If you just do one, you're, you're not going to be a success. You're not likely to be a success, I should say. It's not always true. Um, there are definitely examples of when you are apart, it fails. So for example, um, you guys remember the game called Towns that was released on Steam? It was released as an early access game. It had a lot of promise, right? The business, uh, from a business side, they were set. It somehow stumbled upon a niche that had not been exploited yet. Um, and it, was a, it was a great genre. The game had a great look to it. It was like basically Dwarf Fortress, but in 3D. And, and with a little bit of Minecraft in there, and she's like, oh, it's like, you know, people went insane, but the product was terrible. And they released it too soon because they needed money, because they're running out of cash. And it, it just, it, it actually was one of the things that prompted Steam to give refunds, mm -hmm. oh, which is just which is hard to take. Um, and in terms of, on the other side, um, Minecraft, um, you know, was a tremendous success, right? But uh, Notch wasn't prepared for that success. Because he was an LLC, he lost millions of dollars to taxes because it was all personal income. Ouch, right? Now, there's a trade-off, always trade-off. This is a, to, it costs you a few thousand dollars a year to have a, the, the proper like corporate setup where you, know, you are an employee of your own company and that sort of thing. Um, it's, just, it's a decision you have to make, but if you're aware of it, you've made a choice, that's, that's the first step. Um, Oh yeah, uh, the wrong aesthetic for a target market. Um, do you guys remember that there was a reboot of Prince of Persia? Uh, gosh, about 10 years ago, maybe eight or 10 years ago. Beautiful, it had a watercolor look that no games had, had done before. It was, it was beautiful to look at. Um, and it completely failed from Ubisoft's point of view. And we asked them about that because we, we had a chance to work with them on a different project. They said that, well, um, our target market is 13 to 25. And our, our palette is beautiful, and that's, that's for kids and for older people who have nostalgia or appreciation of beauty, right? So their game, but, but their market was here, and they were, their, their, their aesthetics that said here and here, they completely missed it, right? And so that, that way, their, their marketing, they make, I guarantee there is an art director going, no, it has to be this, otherwise, what's the point, right? And their marketer's going, but why? You know, that's, so these are, these are these conversations that happen all the time. Um, talk about not. I don't have the. I, can't, I don't have a preview of my tiles here, so I have no idea what's coming up next. I apologize. Uh, entering, flood, entering a flooded market with advertising. Um, so last year, about a billion uh, four-player co-op competitive games came out. They were all 2D. Um, they were all you know local multiplayer games, right? And um, <laughs> you know there was Towerfall came out, and then suddenly everybody wanted to make a game like this. Um, they're fairly straightforward to make, and so I think a lot of people were like, oh, that's a good idea, I'll make one too, and then we'll start a business on that. And it didn't sell, and they got really jaded, and it's because, well, you got, it's a flooded market. Like, so I think as designers, as game creators, we have something in our heart that we have to express, right? It's important to recognize that sometimes that's just going, always going to be an idea. You have a billion ideas, and you will get a billion more as you grow. There will be, there will be things that you thought were great that'll be terrible in a year, the things you thought were great, it'll still be great in a year, but have been already been done 10 times. If you're thinking about games as a business, that's a realistic discussion you have to have with yourself. Oh, so I just took a core, who's, who of who those games have been ruined by going free to play, right? Like, now it's free to play, and it just, everything went to shambles. Again, just out of sync. So the, the core of this is, you know, if you're an artist or you're a pastor, I want to be an artist. I once had, uh, Close friend of mine um, asked me <laughs> it was a straightforward question. He goes, um, "When's the last time you felt fulfilled?" And he was totally, totally innocent question. He was just trying to start a conversation. I was struck dumb. I had no idea. Um, and it took me a few years to think about it. But I realized that um, I had I'd been laid off. Well, my contract with Zynga had expired. I was on unemployment. Um, 
uh, and my house is being paid for because I had an underwater mortgage. Um, and so we were, we were poor, basically. But I was working on my own game, and I had, had a six-month window to get a, get a demo done. It was in the summer, and it was in Eugene, it was beautiful. Like, I've got two kids and a wife. Like, my wife grew up poor. She's like, this is fine. We're fine. We love each other. We're healthy. This is great. I was like, that, that was the happiest time of my life. I was abjectly poor. I was being taken care of by the state. I was cleaning the, the gym so I, could be, uh, so I couldn't afford to take martial arts classes. So I cleaned the gym at like 10 o'clock at night just so I could, you know, it was, it was crazy hard and crazy amazing. So honestly, at, at my core, I want, I want to be an artist. That's what, I want that life again. But I don't, I don't have that. That's, that's a liberty. I don't have that right now. That's, I'm a craftsman. And so this is what I do for game jams. You know, I'm like, this is what I want. I, this, is, this, this is a weekend where I'm going to make something that speaks to me that I want to express. But when I have to bring home the bacon, so to speak, this is what I do. And so this, artists do have to pay attention, I think, to um, certain facets of you know, uh, business one-on-one -on -one stuff. Form corporation, tax, tax stuff, a lot of things. But, uh, yes, funded. Um, but this talk really is more uh, focused on, on me and craftsmen and how you can uh, get that business focus. So, to begin with, a craftsman does not say, I want to do this. A craftsman looks at the market and applies their experience and their instinct and their abilities to what they do the audience wants. This is, not, this is not absent of ego. This is not you being a machine. This is you with your own original interpretation of what you see as an opening in the market, or as an underserved market, or as a theme that has gone to, to uh, follow too long, like Skies of Arcadia, Sky Pirates, yes, right? Um, but that, that's not me saying, I love the game, that's me saying, I love that game, and nobody's doing that, hasn't that for a long time, I believe that there is a chance that uh, the audience wants that, right? Among all the ideas I could do, I'm using this criteria to decide. And so this is, this is the second part, this is the, the philosophy of this. Heuristics, right? this is a way to approach solving a problem. So, first of all, what's the, what's the, immu what are the immutable elements of your game? What are things that can't be changed? What are the things that define it? It's creative pillars. Right? For example, if you have geolocation, like Pokemon Go, right, it has to be on a phone. End of discussion. Um, if you require controls, if you have like 16 buttons you have to use, you're going to be on a PC or a console. End of discussion, right? Um, that's your solve. Play session length. If you have an RPG, you know, that requires 10 minutes between save points and uh, uh, battles that last five minutes, um, that is not a good candidate for mobile, I would argue. Because the market has spoken and they, they like fast games, you can pull up, you can play, you can put it down. It's not saying don't do it because you might have a breakout hit, right? But you, if you try to buck paradigms, you're taking great risk. Other things like complexity, like I would argue that mobile games are more simple, but if you've ever looked at a Clash of Clans player who's like serious about it, their spreadsheets and all the stuff they do, uh, okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, theme, you know, again, I think people would argue that uh, more fun stuff. It's better for mobile, but there are also there are hardcore gritty gritty action games going on it. Aesthetic. I mean, all these. So these things, I think, are. It's kind of, it's, it's easy to say. Well, all console games are hardcore, or all PC games are strategy games. But that's not really true, right? So th this this can be a trap. But I am arguing that there are things that will say, you know what, this design that you decided has a, that has a business need and a market. We just have an, an actual a natural home. The next step is, um, since we're, you're a craftsman and you have to make money, is how are you going to make money? Um, you know, a uh, purchase, a subscription, uh, sorry, in-app purchases, DLC, ads. Um, the thing is, Dota on Steam has 900,000 daily average users. The number three game has only 65,000. Number 10, 30,000. So, can you make money on 30,000 people a day playing your game. How much money are you getting per user per month? Is that enough to keep your, your, your business afloat? Um, and I don't like this, um, but you know, we, I worked on a game called Epic Skater that 
you know, our industry has evolved so quickly that in the six months I worked on it, we changed monetization strategies numerous times because like CPM, uh, cost, uh, cost per thousand of we would get for the ads, it would change so dramatically, it just dropped. If we had to go to video ads, which we had to integrate, integrate new technology, which had to change the game design a little bit, like, oh, it's crazy. Right? We pushed back against this. This wasn't the game we wanted to play. This isn't, this isn't the game we want. But we're a business. We have to do it. And we were able to apply our experience and our instinct and our ideas to do it well. And I think that's the part that a lot of us hate. We hate being pushed into, goaded into making decisions strictly for the money, but again, this is really about making the best product for the best business. And have faith in yourself, right? I think oftentimes we, we have a germ of an idea and we won't stop until it's fully expressed, right? But you're, you're a designer and a creator because you're good at solving problems. I would say that this is a chance, if, you, if you're presented with some strange uh, modernization problem, it's a chance to um, innovate and make something interesting. Um, TAM is a great, uh, great thing to know, your total addressable market. Um, so for example, we will never sell more iPhone games than their iPhones. That's a hard, get there, there's your balance, right? That's the biggest balance. So uh, realistically, you're gonna get maybe, can you get 1% of that? How many phones is that? Is that enough to you know, monetize and make enough money? Um, when, I'm making, when I'm making chess heroes, and so I looked at all of the, uh, the chess games on Steam, they sold an average of five to 7,000 copies, which is not a lot. Um, and so that's a, that's, a, that's a gut check. It's just like, okay, am I doing something different? Like, like am I just basically, am I, going, am I walking into a trap effectively? Um, and I think if you, ha if you can look at that and have an honest discussion with yourself, for example, we noticed that like every chess game had seven to 10,000 sales at least. Some games have like 300 sales. Right? But what that told us was, and the, and the price difference between those games was like $10 up to $50. So we're like, okay, so that what we believe is there's a market of chess buyers. They don't care the prices, they just love chess. They're gonna try it. And hopefully, since we believe we're doing something different, they'll stick around and we'll keep coming back and we'll sell more. Um, so yeah, Steam Spy. Uh, is just, I mean, there are many, 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 many tools out there. Definitely do research, share them with your friends. Um, App Age for mobile. Um, and like I said, this may surprise you. Like you might find interesting results that will bolden you and say, you know, this is, this is actually possible. Um, and again, this is all about trying to avoid stepping into a crowded market, right? Because if you're making, I'm sorry, if you're making a dungeon crawler, that's roguelike, that's pixel art, it's isometric. You got a long road, my friend. <laughs> like it's, that's, that's a tough one to crack. Um, and, and you gotta be honest with yourself. You gotta say like, well, um, but if every game like that released sold 100,000 copies, you know, there's a good chance you're gonna sell at least 50,000, right? So, you know, it's, again, this is about putting on that a different hat, like the monocle, right? And she says, I believe we'll sell 50K. Um, <laughs> Uh, lifetime value of average user. So once you have uh, an estimate of how many users you will have, how many people will buy your game, you have to decide and figure out how much money you will make on average per user. So Pokemon Go makes 25 cents per user right now. And it makes six million dollars a day because the total just the market is one sixth the population of the earth. Um, for Steam games, you know, they take 30% and then you pay taxes. So it's seven minus taxes, um, which seems nice, but also a lot of Steam games are put into bundle deals where they get a dollar or two or less per copy sold. And so now the average just plummeted down to three or four dollars minus taxes. And so, um, and so this is also where uh, the cost, is, this, is, this is the fundamental formula, right? How many people will buy your game? How much are they worth to you per user? And how much does it cost to get them to buy it? Right? I'm going to talk about this later, but um, one of the reasons I came here today is that I want to talk to people, especially who are believers, say, don't launch and pray. Okay, that is not how you do it. Um, you need to have an idea of what it's going to take to get your users. So yeah, on mobile, it costs between $2.50 and 5 bucks per user 
So if you don't make five dollars off your users, when you're getting like tw like ten cents for a thousand video ads, you you better have a scale of them millions of players per day to make that possible. Um, so there's a thing uh, I learned this thing called K value, where uh, some users are worth more than others because they draw additional players into the game and increase your user base. So those that they're, they're, so that K value is basically a track through viral and social elements. So, so they talk about the game. This is what EA, EA talked about this you know years ago. Like there there are trendsetters who buy like hardcore games and then they they evangelize them to other people and then suddenly this just sort of spreads right. Um, so, you know, as, as part of your game design, I know this is sort of, it's no longer a catchy or nouveau, but um, try to integrate elements that allow people to share their experiences on, on, uh, on Snapchat or on Instagram or on Twitter, on Facebook. Like, let them express themselves through your game. And so that, rate, so that way, they're using your game as a platform to show the people, and that drives up um, exposure to your game. Um, which and so exposure to the game drives down the cost of acquisition. Does that make sense, to everybody? The more, because discovery is your number one enemy. Discover discovery is the thing that will sink your ship or not. Yeah. And when since you specifically mentioned Facebook, it's like fan page of games. You're going to get a few percentage of what you post, whereas if they're posting on their own walls, a large percentage of their friends will see it. Exactly. And so Facebook is just one of the many. Like, this is why Zynga, Zynga succeeded, right? Their games are crap. I've worked there. I know. Um, but when you have when you have sixty when you have sixty million people spending an average of ten cents a day, you can do the math. This is six hundred thousand dollars a day, huh? Right. So there's something there. Um, and then in terms of you know cost of user acquisition for non-mobile, like I I couldn't find any hard numbers on that, but that's basically marketing, right? You're basically saying I'm going to put this ad on the paper. Uh, it's A/B testing. If I put an ad out on Google versus Facebook. How many uh, links do I get to my website? Off links to a website. So, so basically, you, you, what you measure is you'd say, okay, I'm gonna put an ad out on Facebook. I get from you know from 10,000 impressions, I get 1,000 hits to my, my web page. From those 1,000 hits to my web page, I sell 100 games. That is your cost of user acquisition. So that that cost of, of those 10,000 ads led to 100 sales. That is your cost. Um, and this, and this, this right here, this is, this is literally business 101. Like, how much does it cost to make something, and how much does it cost to sell it? Um, and if if one is higher than the other, if it costs more to make it than it does to sell it, then you are losing money and you are running out of cash. Um, pour the bucket in. Like you, you just like you, you are literally printing money. Um, so we, ever, we all want to be there. Um, it's hard, but I think that is a great way to distill discussion into terms that we can all agree on, right? We may disagree on art, or on design, or on, on server maintenance, right? But if we can say, you know what? We make a dollar and one cent for every dollar we spend in the discussion. Like, we, 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 maybe we can drive it higher. Maybe our, our you know, maybe if we increase our server farms, it goes down to 99 cents for every dollar we spend, you know? How, how much runway do we have? How much can we, how long can we afford to be losing money, right? And then it becomes a trade-off, right? Then it becomes, well, we, we have to lose money to make a game, because that six months is you not making any income, right? After you launch the game, do you just stop? After you launch the game, are you listening to your users and spending money to address their needs? Are you, are you uh, spending money to add multiplayer? Are you spending money to advertise because you have this great new DLC coming out? Like, this, this is, again, this is how entrepreneurs basically see the world. It is how much time do I have? to climb out of the red and into the black. I would argue that unlike uh, movies and books uh, and uh, music, yeah, uh, games have a special element with, with players, right? So if you have, so for example, I'm working on a you know, chess here. It's basically a strategy game. Um, um, for that, that treats chess as basically soldiers. Uh, I, I could do what I can do with that. I could have online multiplayer. I could have a scenario builder. I could have special powers and all in, in 500 environments, right? Um, 
but I haven't actually tested it on the market to see if people actually want it yet, right? And so maybe instead of spending three or four years on it and then releasing it, maybe I should get my minimum viable product out to market, right? One that I'm proud of, one that is polished and high quality, but I didn't just spend three years of my life and money on it. Maybe I spent six to eight months on it, and then I iterate based on the feedback I get. Hey, I want to build scenarios. Hey, I want to play with my, my friends in China. Like, okay, that is telling me, the, uh, the market is telling me where to go next, right? And this is where I think a lot of amateur game designers spend, right? We write down, we write these huge design docs, we play it in our heads, and then we go play some other game for inspiration, right? Um, this is where you need to be, right? Make games, iterate, take it to game cons, like, you're, you've probably played a few games right here on the, on the floor, but you've been like, mm, I can use a little more work, right? But tell the person that, because they may, they may not, they may, that may be a blind spot to them. So if you, if you observe your audience, you will get more insight, I think, than you will anywhere else, and it will tell you if your game is good or not. Like if you're, if you're at, if you're, at, if you have, a, if there are a bunch of games, so at Eugene we have these play test nights, where we go to Barcade, and we set up games all over, um, some of the games have no people. They have the person who made the game sitting there by themselves, right? Uh, and other games just have a crowd, right? Well, I think the person who's just sitting there by himself either maybe brought a strategy game which is a little bit slower and kind of misjudged the, the night, or if the game is not very good, right? That's what it's, you know, that may be the case. But if you observe your audience, they're having trouble in the menu system, and there's like, they don't really care what character they are, they don't care what color they are, or their team, when they don't enter the name. But once they start playing, they light up. Dude, trash that, that first the first part, get into the game as fast as possible, and improve your game and make it just that much better. Because that's what people want, right? But also, be honest with yourself, if people aren't enjoying it, be like, maybe this was just not, thank you. What I heard when you explained it to me, got me excited, you sure aren't there yet, just keep going. Or, we were telling you to stop, you weren't listening because you kept going. Um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> this is hard for me because I talk to a lot of amateur game designers <laughs> and and this is this is how they usually start. Like, but in this game, you're like um, you're this young kid in this village, and like your parents are dead, but like you don't know why, and you have these these powers and it's just like, I'm just like, oh, please stop, you know, like, <laughs> please stop. And he's on just like that, too. This is, <laughs> this is, it's not like this. Like, um, story's definitely important, but what's, what's ironic is people don't care until they've actually bought the game. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, I have never bought a game to tell you this story. I'm like, yeah, right, yeah. You may have. Exception word of adver word of mouth advertising. You may, just, you may suspend that because someone you trust really, really told you it's worth it. Yeah. It's possible. If, if, if you can come up with a story that sells me a game, and, and you can give it to me in one or two sentences, I'll hire you as a writer. That's amazing, <laughs> right? But, but people, when you ask, you ask people, why did you like that game? I guarantee you, and if they played the game for a few minutes, they're not going to be like, dude, this story was amazing. Because they haven't finished it yet. The reason, I mean, and if they say, if, if they're like, oh, let's see what happens next, what happens next, what happens next, yes, okay, you have something there. But for the most part, they're gonna say, it's pretty. It feels good to play. It makes me feel empowered. It was frustrating, but I solved it, and I felt good about myself, right? right. I kicked my brother's butt, and that felt great, or, you know, whatever, right? This is not, the story is not what makes your game unique. What makes your game unique is what people put into it and take out of it, right? And how it stands apart, again, I hate to say it again, but from the market. Right? If you have a game where there are four people sitting on a couch, shooting each other, your game's not unique. Like, it may have a cool looking art style, but the game's not unique. You know, it may, you may have bigger guns, but your game's not unique. It is an iteration of something that is already great. Um, and it's always hard to hear this, possibly, for some of you, but it's, it's the truth. Um, but none of this means that your game can't succeed. Again, follow your heart, make a decision, but be informed that you are basically stacking a deck against yourself by a by a theory forward. So in my opinion, there are four types of game companies. 
so for example, let's say you, let's say you do make uh, dungeon crawler RPGs. I mean, that's people have been doing it literally since the dawn of the computer age. Uh, but you make work that is so good that it stands apart. It is it is high quality. Um, it's, it sets the bar. It is always it just stands apart, and that that's that is value, right? It's hard to do as an indie, I would argue, but it's definitely possible. Like Capybara uh, Games, um, Bland Beer. Uh, there are a lot of companies that just have really figured out how to take a small team of people and make something unique and special. This is something that I think a lot of Western devs don't get. I think it's more something that people like in China and Australia and Europe get. Um, if you release an iPhone game every month, let's just say, every time you release a game, when they go to download it, whoever downloads it, will see the other games you've made on the side, right? So they suddenly just, they just winter down a billion games to yours, right? In your game, you can promote your game for free. You, if they're playing a game and they like it, they may match your sensibilities, you may have found a loyal customer. You may have found people that will look up your back catalog because they like the games you make. They will tell their friends, this is really kind of cool, right? This is a business strategy. Um, if you have a community, if you have an MMO that you've put together with spit and like and duct tape and toothpicks, but it's got this fierce people that just, they just love it. They don't know why. They, they log in, they feel safe there, they feel welcome there. Like they, they, there's something about it that is theirs in a sense. It's not special in the sense that it's got knights and mages and it's a fantasy game, but but it's theirs, right? And they feel like that game belongs to them and vice versa. Well. You can, this is a cold way to say it, but you can monetize a community, right? And I don't feel bad about saying that because that's their hobby. Does that make sense? People love to spend money on their hobbies. If you have created a game and that's somebody's hobby, they're like, yeah, I'll spend five bucks on a main sword. It's a main sword. And it supports, and it supports the developer. I spend 30 hours a week on this game. Five bucks is nothing, right? That is a viable business strategy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's definitely viable. And then this, you know, Minecraft, I, I, I it's, a, it's just it's too hard to ignore. I should, I, should, I should find better examples, but Minecraft wasn't the first game that had uh, 3D tiles. That was Infinite Mine. I think Infinite Mine was probably one of the first ones. But some magic sauce led that one to become the one that completely took the market. Nobody had ever seen something like that before. Um, and there are a number of games where there are maybe one or two precursors, but then one just blew it open because the market didn't know what about it yet. And the first one that came out, the first one that blew up, blew up big. And, and you may have a gift in it, right? right? Um, I don't know how much you guys believe in, in spiritual gifts. Uh, I do, and I do believe there are people who just, they can discern, right? It's not seeing the future so much as like looking at the present and kind of like, kind of leaning back and kind of like, hmm, you know, what if we did this? Right, and like that special sauce makes gives them that edge in doing this. Um, don't lie to yourself and say that you know you're you're an innovator when you're just uh, you're tweaking one small variable. You know, this is this is a, a cataclysmic change, right? Something that's never been seen before. Uh, and so, before we get into the dry stuff, um, I want to take a quick break so that we're going kind of quickly. And see if anybody has any questions. Or has any comments on it so far? It's just numbers didn't add up. What it's they, they, they really don't. It's just it's expensive, and a lot of a lot of games uh, sell ad space to other games. It's sort of a incestuous kind of market, yeah. um, and breaking out into the open. Um, it's basically like you know, look at games that are mainstream that are mobile, like Angry Birds, right? If you can get on their ad network then you're effectively marketing yourself to mainstream customers. If you're marketing to a more niche game, it's a more niche customer base, it's smaller, it costs you less money. And some of those, like, like there are, uh, like, people who make slot machine games, like, they have effectively a captive audience that goes from game to game to game to game. And that's the same game, mm -hmm. different skin, right? Um, so, I mean, the answer to your question is, it's, yeah, it, there, is no, there is no right answer, there's an easy answer, but, Really, it came to boil down to a simple cost equation, and then also A/B testing. 
Like if you have two thousand dollars, spend a thousand dollars here and a thousand dollars there, and see if it gets you the best results, and then repeat the best result. Um, so, um, whatever. So. I haven't. I haven't had. I haven't had that. Um, I have had bloggers talk about my work. I've never had a, a video blogger. Gotcha. No, I take it back. There for, for a few game jams, but um, the thing is, you can't buy that. Right. Right. right? And I think that. Um, so I think later on, I'm going to talk about metrics metrics of success. I think for a lot of people, having their game played by PewDiePie would be like a metric of success. Like yes, right. right. But you can't plan for that. Right. And I think that uh, what I'm trying to focus on though is like what you can focus, what you can do. And so I think like. If, for example, um, one of your team members is good at video blogging, mm -hmm. maybe they just they keep doing that, right? And right. they write video blogs for other games, and that draws attention to them, and then they can use that to draw attention to your game. And then maybe that will pull you into a, a, a circle, right? So that can, that can be a plan. And I would say just you need to have somebody pounding the streets, emailing them, sending them video messages. Uh, links to your blog, links to your website, links to your trailer. You just have to put it out there so they have a decision, a choice to say no, right? If you just wait for them to find it, they're busy, you know? Right, right. And so what I'm saying, so one of the, one of the big things I want you guys to take away from this is that business development is a full-time job, right? It, it, it can consume your entire day. And that's not making games, that's making the business around games. So that's a great example. Like, if you want people to play your game on, a, on YouTube, you have to get in touch with them, and that takes time. So, um, yeah. Sure, we'll, we'll do a good job. It also takes it also takes a lot of faith, right? So, like for example, there's a game that I'll give you a second. Uh, there's a game called uh, Super Fight that Pyperx is creating. Now, Super Fight is a card game where nerds argue about things, like <laughs> Batman plus uh, armed with ferocious badgers versus a horde of zombies with pop guns. <laughs> Who would win? And they argue about it, right? And it's just like it's delicious. I deny it. But right, so but um, so what they did is they took they took this card game and turned it into a Twitch game where people on Twitch watch two people arguing about the cards they have, <laughs> and they vote on Twitch. Now, it, so it, 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 it's launching, I think it launched actually, you should check it out. But like, the growth curve is like this. It is hilarious. People who are, like there's one guy who acts like Batman, with a voice and everything, he's like, <laughs> Batman wins, <laughs> of course. You know, like that, that's the shtick. And it's just like, okay, people have, Taking this game, and again, they've, made, they've created a community, right? They've made it their own. At any point in the game's development, somebody could say, that's a stupid idea. I don't get it. Nope. Done. It would have flushed it because there's nothing else like it. They're disrupting. They're creating a community. But, like, I think when it comes to quality, that gulf right there where you're like, I, I know we can get here, but right now it looks like crap. But there are purple detectors everywhere. Something is broken. I don't know. We have six months. Uh, right? But what I'm talking about is if, that, if that's your core identity, if you're like, this is what we do or we're nothing, I think that makes a lot more sense. I mean, it is something that you basically, you don't just decide to be a high quality maker, right? You're like, you know what, this is going to be hard, and you keep going. Like, that's probably not realistic. You, no, but there's probably a game that has similar traits to yours, right? And so there's an art to this. this is, it's not a science, right? You look for games that are RPGs, okay, that, you've, okay, that just, okay. Now games with, um, that are turn-based, okay. Now you have a subsection. Games, or games that have uh, are future versus sci-fi or sci-fi versus fantasy. Okay, there we go. Now look at that. Now look at that. We've we've now taken the billions of games and made them this big. Okay, so now uh, which ones are aimed at kids, aimed at adults? Which ones have mature themes? Okay, and so as you as you, you're slowly pulling stuff, and if you have something that's that's different, it's not covered by any games. Oh, okay, hold on. That's pretty cool. Like, uh, have you guys played uh, Tale uh, Valkyria Chronicles? So Valkyria Chronicles is a strategy game. The difference is, and it's turn-based, where you, you select a soldier, do stuff, done. The difference is that you move in real time as opposed to moving around a map. That's pretty cool. That's a unique selling point, a USP, um, which you know, which you can't, there is no, you can't find a TAM for that. That's just, that's a unique, that's a unique thing. But you can say, well, it's a cell shaded game, so that's going to turn some people on, some, some turn some people off. It's a set in that special Japanese World War II environment that doesn't make any sense. Um, no, what I mean is like the, you know, Jap the, the Japanese love to take Western history and do their own thing with it, um, which, which is precious. Uh, uh, but I, I would argue, though, that in most cases, um, 
and it's not a science, but you can get a good a good idea. And it, it again, sometimes the net does end up being this big. Like you say, RPGs. There are games that have sold thirty copies on Steam. Like <laughs> and they're probably at RPGs because like it's this tough sell, right? So be honest and say, well, maybe they just launched it and didn't never have any marketing. Did they have a Kickstarter campaign, right? Like the games that you feel like. So and so, I would say dig deeper. Once you have the number that you feel is realistic, do they have a post mortem, right? Um, did they talk about their development process? Uh, is their website any good? Did they do any marketing that you can find? Um, all of these things, right? So it's not just finding a number and saying, yep, that's it. It really is a, a full-time job. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Are you good? Visual works are intellectual property. What does that mean? Um, property is a thing that you can own, right? And you can sell. So let's say that us four are making a game. Code, art, you're writing the QA docs and you're doing the sound design. Um, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm the web guy. Um, so we all work on a game and we, uh, you, we all contribute our assets to it and we put it on Steam and we sell it. Who owns, who owns that game? Well, you own the code, you own the art, and you own the sound. Like, we, nobody owns it. But not right? the bucks. Not the bucks. <laughs> no, that's, that's the code guy. It's your fault. I'm sorry. Um, the, and, uh, the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that um, I think independent developers, we, we're like, we have this sort of, these rose tinted glasses, like, it's all going to be great, guys. It's going to be fun. We're just going to make a game. It's going to be great. Um, the, realistically, though, uh, if you guys break big, that's going to cause problems, right? Who owns what um, is, is, a, is a really a big deal. And so you need to have a contributor agreement to assign those rights to a third party that nobody, it's not me or it's not you, or it's, it's a third thing, it's a company. It's an entity that can own property. I was gonna say that I'll believe a, a company is a person when Texas executes one, but that was a bit grim. Um, so you form a company to own the intellectual property that your contributors are making. Um, and the reason you do this is a, there's a deeper reason, um, which is that contracts protect relationships, right? If, if you and I say, I'm gonna pay, I'll pay you 40 bucks for this art, and then I give you 10 bucks, you're like, what's the deal? And I'm like, I feel like it's worth $10. That's not what the contract says, right? Or if you know, if we decide to sell the thing you made that we agreed is owned by the company, uh, and it's not specified how much of that percentage you get, right? Then we're going to argue about it. And if we argue about it, feeling like it hurt, we may never work again together. And that could, something that could have been beautiful just broke, right? So what it does is there are times that may be difficult. Hopefully not in your company and with the people you work with. And so, so for example, my. Uh, my sister and her, and her husband own a farm. And they started that farm with another couple and everything was great, right? Mm -hmm. And they formed an LLC and they did everything right. And uh, then the other couple, they weren't working as much and they were demanding more money because they had these needs. And she's like, no, we agreed. And they're like, no, they're like, you know what, you, you gotta buy us out. You have to pay us $50,000 to buy our share of the farm. And like, what, what, how, what? And you know, things fell apart and it just got really ugly. So if they had had, in the good times, prepared for that occasion and said, if we decide this is not working out, we'll do X. Uh, if we need money to take a loan, we'll do Y, right? There are th these things you can foresee um, that can prevent uh, real emotional trauma from happening. Because remember, I mean, we're, we're, we're here on this earth not to collect collateral, right, is to be with other people and to improve each other, uh, iron sharp and iron, but if you, <laughs> we're, but we're, also, we're also people, right, and that's, that's problematic sometimes. Um, so this is where, um, so I'll talk about the LLC, S Corp stuff in a second, um, but first of all, find a lawyer who's experienced the bad stuff. Because I think a lot of us will, will be naive. We're like, do we do each other since childhood? We're good, man. Like, we had this dream. It's going to be great. And they're like, yeah, I've seen that before. Here's what happened. Here's why it was bad. Um, 
And I, and I think that, I, again, because we're, we're talking about seeing things through a business lens, it's a little bit colder, it's a little bit more realistic. It's less about um, finding a dream than protecting everybody involved, right? Um, so again, like you know, gain the agreement beforehand on buyouts and dissolution. Right? Who owns who owns the game if you guys break up the company? Um, this is important. I think um, it's easy to say. You know, what? I'm gonna, I'm just going to put in an extra forty hours of marketing a a, month, a week, but you you put in a thousand dollars, right? Well, let's say that person who puts in a thousand dollars is suddenly short on their rent. Forty hours of marketing is not going to pay their rent, right? Um, this is crude but effective. Like, I would argue, um, based on my experience and what I learned from others, that all the founders need to put in the same amount of money. Just because that way, there's no argument. Like, there's no equivocation. There's no arbitrage. It's just like, yeah, we both we all put in a thousand bucks or fifty bucks or however much you have, right? Um, and from that there, you move forward. But it, it does sort of set the table and, and makes it round in that sense that everybody's uh, square. <laughs> it's a round table, everybody's squared up with each other. Oh boy. I need some more, co I need some more coffee. With um, in the game. Yeah, <laughs> it's, an X, it's an X table. Um, so this is where talking to an accountant is great because um, I got s slammed by this. Um, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna give you some numbers here. So. I'm an engineer uh, and I'm a contractor, which means I can command some pretty good money even though I work at Eugene. And my plan was to earn money to uh, pay other people to work on my game. Uh, last year was unexpectedly very good. Uh, I was very blessed. And I ended up with, I think, uh, I think I had $70,000 in, in my company account. Um, and I had spent a lot of that and I'd earned more than that, and I, but I'd spent it on contractors and like, on on equipment and office space and like you know like just trying to like get into GameCon, um, and but <laughs> I'm an LLC, like that was even though it was a separate bank account, it's treated as personal income, and so I paid. So my plan was to can I paid myself a salary every month. Um, and my plan was to continue, and so based on that, I mean, I had a burn rate of like a year. I was set, right? And then I'd be able to pay other people, and it'd be great. Well, um, I got taxed on the entire amount. And that, I paid $30,000 in taxes. And it's just like, oh. You know, and so if I had, if I had uh, an S Corp or C Corp, I would have paid probably half that, right? I think, and then, but then that, that but then I would have been taxed on the money I paid myself. But the key thing is I would have been taxed next year, <laughs> right? When I was when I needed it to, to make stuff. And so, yeah. Out of curiosity, all the expenses that you, the contractor, yep. the, that was not deductible? It was deductible. Okay. So but anything left over? For example, I, I, you know, I'm running this Kickstarter. I'm running this Kickstarter uh, in September and it ends in October, right? Let's say, let's say I make $100,000, right? And I spend... I spend seventy thousand dollars getting stuff done, and at the end of the year, December thirty first, I have thirty thousand dollars left over from that Kickstarter. Yay me, right? Well, no, that's all taxed. If I reincorporate as an S corp or a C corp, that is now owned by the corporation. They pay, I think, fifteen percent on the taxes. And then they, the rest of it rolls over to the next year, and then does that make sense? Like it's it's just, and so I, the reason I put everything up there again, just to reinforce, like. Um, talk, talk, find a bookkeeper. Like find somebody you trust. Find somebody uh, that that a reference somebody else knows, right? Because you're going to have a lot of honest conversations with them, and you want to be protected. Um, because this, I want all of you guys to have a huge windfall, but I don't want you guys to get burned by by poor planning. And and again, these this carries upfront costs. Like it, it, an LLC costs you 100 bucks a year. This costs you more than that. Um, and so, but again, it's really just about planning and making the right decision. But being empowered to make the right decision, um, even if it turns out to be wrong, at least like, for unforeseen things, <coughs> right? You didn't like, you weren't like, oh, I should have thought about that, right? I think it's always okay to make a mistake if, you know, if, if things change. I think it's inexcusable to be like, well, I had no idea, but it's okay. 
um, critical agreements. So, uh, yeah, so a contributor agreement. Um, this is a, a piece of paper that says that anything I make for this company is owned by that company, right? Um, a work agreement. This talks about what you're paid. This talks about how you get fired. This talks about what happens when you get fired. Um, mutual or unilateral NDA. Again, not being a lawyer, I, I'm trying to figure out how much I can really, I should say with these things. Look it up. But um, the, I think as indies, we're like, no, we want people to talk about our stuff, right? Um, well, we, so we don't, want to, we don't want people not to talk about it. However, let's say you do break big and somebody wants to buy you. They want everybody to have NDAs, right? And so plan for the unplannable. Just this, this doesn't hurt anything. Make sure it's in there. A non-circumvent agreement. Let's say that you're a contractor and you're hiring an artist to work for you so you can do work for a university. Um, if they agree to this, then they won't sidestep you and then go to the university directly. Right? This protects your business interest. Um, I, I forgot the real name for this. Um, it's not libel, but um, when things go sour, and they sometimes do, it is easy to go to the internet and just heave to, right? Um, if you guys, again, this is part of the dissolution agreements, and, and this is usually part of the work agreement, um, just, agree not, just agree to be nice in public. Like, you can just pass each other and be like, you know, but in, in, in public, especially on the internet, you know, you can, you can say that you guys, no matter what happens, we're not going to call each other names, we're not going to, inf you know, write inflammatory comments, we're going to be polite, because this is our livelihood, and this is important. Um, so, bank account, um, don't give everybody <laughs> the keys to the, the vault. Um, you know, have a, have a system, you know, maybe a two, two, uh, no, two people have to sign a check or something like that. Um, does anybody, does, has anybody not heard of the corporate veil? Does everybody understand that this is very important? Okay, corporate veil. I have in my pocket a company credit card and a personal credit card. If I go to Wendy's and I'm hungry, because they don't have Wendy's in Eugene anymore, it's a long story. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, I deserve this Wendy's burger. Uh, I'm going to buy myself a burger. And, and it's not for business reasons. Um, I'm spending company cash on personal stuff. Regardless of the fact it's taxed as personal income, um, I'm spending company money on personal stuff. I am buying a boat for uh, marketing reasons. You know, I'm buying a boat to take people out for a thing. And, you either have to argue that, but that's really that's going to get the IRS's attention. So, so the corporate veil is incredible because corporations are fa or don't exist, right? They don't they're not actually real. There's this sort of this vestigial sort of imagination land that kind of exists there, and if you puncture that by saying, "Well, it's it's all my money anyway," what you're effectively saying is this this company doesn't really exist. This is really me, right? So then you've lost your um, protection from lawsuits. You've, the IRS is going to be you be on IRS's radar. It's bad news, right? So understand this and respect it because it's important. But also, this also keeps this is this is really comes down to ethics, right? Especially if you have multiple people who hold the bank account, then understand that if somebody goes on a spending spree at a club uh, with a company bank account, that that's not that's not good, right? That, that could it could threaten your entire company. Um, this is this is hard. This is hard to do for. <laughs> For me, because I, I really mo I love to make things, I don't really love doing the bookkeeping part. Um, but I found it to be pretty crucial because you know, it basically checks. You go through all of the, the your, your account balance from here to here, and you go through all your account stuff from there to there. And it, uh, you know, if you, you know if you're square, right? And that helps you, you know, keeps you a good uh, helps you understand like how much you know, what's your what's your runway like now? How much more time do you have left? What are your costs? Maybe your costs are bigger or smaller than you thought they were. Maybe that changes your calculations. Um, this also helps you on you know, on January 1st to get all your taxes in line, you get that just taken care of and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then setting aside money for taxes, again, talk to an accountant, but you know, I, I would say like if you pull in 100 bucks, set aside 50, if you're an LLC for taxes, just put it into a savings account, right? Like that's, that's a general suggestion, but don't, don't be like, don't owe the IRS money. Basically, yeah. First of all, um, 
your accountant works for you, right? They are uh, providing you a service, and so you have the right to say, what's this? What's this? Why is this here, right? I would never give an accountant um, you know, the ability to withdraw funds. I would say, you tell me how much you need to pay, and you explain to me how much, you, and it's, if, it's a, I, if it's a jaw-dropping amount, I'm like, can you explain this to me? Because I, I would really like to understand, like, and my wife is great at this. I'll be like, yep, okay, it's, okay, I guess, whatever. She's like, really? So on line 32, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, it's, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is like just, uh, you have a right to know, right? And I think you, you can advocate for yourself. Um, and if you know, uh, this is where your network is, is, is incredibly valuable, right? If you know people who've had good experiences, like, who, who, do you, who do you talk to? Like, who do you got, right? And, and I think that, and that helps everybody, so. Uh, yeah, so these things cause a lot of confusion. Um, copyright, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. I'll run through these really quickly. Uh, first of all, copyright, you have that automatically with any published work. Um, you can get a registered copyright, which makes it stronger. Uh, however, in the world of video games, you've seen, you've seen clones, right? Um, that's, you, can't, you can't copyright an idea. Right, you can't copyright a theme. You copyright a fixed expression of work. You can trademark a distinct visual style that represents something that if somebody were to present something similar that could create market confusion, right, then you could take them to court. The thing is, this isn't automatic. Uh, and that, neither are patents, right? These are only as viable as the money you can spend in court to defend them. And with the trademarks, you have to defend them or you lose them. So um, I would say, <laughs> you know, trademark stuff like your game logo. If you can, trademark your trade dress of your game if it does stand apart, right? On the off chance that somebody does violate it and you have the option of defending it, um, this, this, this costs you between $500 and $2,000. But um, if, some, if a multi-million dollar company comes in and clones your game, yes, go to court. If some Joe Schmo does it and you send them a nice letter and they just keep doing it, you're like, well, I don't have $5,000 to make it happen. You've basically, you've basically lost your trademark, but I think it's really, again, informed decision, right? Trade secrets. Um, you may create something um, really amazing that has some really sweet stuff under the hood uh, and that may attract a buyer, may attract an investor. Maybe somebody's like, you know what? Like, you guys have a secret sauce that we that we want a piece of. Um, and let's say you don't have trades. Let's say you don't have a trade secret agreement with your, your five minutes. <gasps> okay, uh, <laughs> they can just hire the people who made it as opposed to uh, breaking into your company. Oh, geez, five minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, you are an employee. No, 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 jeez. Um, <laughs> God. Oh, yeah, no, this is a big one. This is a big one. This is huge. Securities law is not a joke. It is not a joke. There, and typically, like, if you run a red light or you are, no, no, don't run a red light. <laughs> Stop sign. Like, you're like, oh, sorry, officer, you know, I didn't see it. I was tired or whatever. So, yeah, okay, I'll let you go. Securities, like, like yeah, so I gave somebody a stock option. Um, and I didn't tax them, and it was a, they filled out they filled the wrong form. But you know, maybe next time they go, oh, you're going to jail. <laughs> oh, you're paying us a million dollars. What? Like so? Um, what? Now there are you can give bonuses, and there are ways to do options uh, for startups. Um, I guess my point is, don't don't just do what you hear on, read on the internet, right? Like, yeah, we're, we're a startup. We give options. That's what we do, right? That's the thing. Talk to a securities law lawyer. Um, before you do so, because um, the cost of not doing so will probably bankrupt you. I'm not joking. Uh, contractors. Oh god, this is so huge. Five minutes, really? Um, so uh, we can give them five more. You can't. You can't. You you and I can't agree that you're you know you're a contractor. I'm gonna pay you X amount of money, but then you come to my office and use my computers and use my software and you do this amount of work and this amount of time. That's that's an employee. Right. So even though even though you and I agree we're contractors, right? You're not. And if you get hurt, you can claim disability. If you if I let you go, you can claim unemployment. And you can say, well, he said I was a contractor, but actually this is how 
this is what I was doing, and they'll say, oh, yeah, he was an employee, so you got to pay up. And now you're on the radar of the IRS again. Read up on this. I think people may take – this is – this. people get messed up with this all the time, and people flaunt this all the time. People, even if they know the difference, they don't care. And, guys, we are better than that, okay? We do it right. Um, yep, that's what I just said. Uh, good contracts. Uh, let's just talk about this later in person. Uh, raising money without equity. Uh, I know you guys want to talk about how to get money, um, but giving up equity requires shares, requires a lot of other things. Um, talk to your contractors. Will they accept payment plans? Maybe they don't need to be all paid up front. Maybe like, yep, I pay you 300 bucks a month for the next you know, six months. Will that, and will that will be good? Uh, bartering system. Live and well, guys. Like, do, you have a, do you have a garden? Can you fix cars? Like, is there something you can do to trade for that work? Uh, launch early. Get your MVP out there. Start generating a trickle of revenue and, and reinvest that in your product and just keep that pump going. Or, you know, just take the slow train. You know, spin a call like I did. Take a couple of years to uh, make, get it done. Uh, this is this is the, the big one. Um, this is why you need to have somebody full time doing marketing because it is a full time job. It is a full time job. The only way to get discovered is hard work, and sometimes luck. Like I'm saying with the YouTubers, like you just have somebody just constantly, constantly knocking on their door. Really, what it comes down to. So I'll say as an example for chess heroes. Um, I know that people who like chess love to talk about chess. There are chess clubs, there are chess magazines, and uh, a lot, there have been several chess video games have been released. I have a list of all those email addresses, right? And so then from a Kickstarter I have, I am creating, I'm trying to hopefully have every week before, the four weeks before and four weeks during the Kickstarter I have a, a video and a blog article posted. And so then what I'm doing is, uh, so then I have a pipeline of content to, for discovery and awareness. And so for all those people, they're going to hear about it. And it's going to take a long time to get through all that, right? So chunk, 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 chunk. Um, and then I have a, a social media ecosystem, so they can plug into Twitter or Facebook or whatever, Snapchat, not Snapchat, uh, Instagram. Um, and, so that, and so basically it's, it's setting up that framework and then doing the legwork and then creating the content to keep things going. That's marketing, as far as I'm concerned. Um, oh, just one thing to add. The session after this was marketing. So. Oh, sweet. Um, <laughs> uh, community real quick. All this is important. Don't name call people. If somebody hates your game, let them hate it. Don't defend it. Just be like, thank you for your opinion. We hope we can change your mind next time. Yeah, I see that. That's a tough lot of to do. On, online, that really right. backfires. Okay. Okay, this is, this is I'm going to race through this. Um, okay, this is Christian. I can talk about this because we're CGC, CGDC. Uh, Matthew 4 7, when Satan says, jump off the temple, God will catch you. Do not test the Lord your God. I think a lot of people launch their game and pray, right? It's going to work out. It's like, well, did you did you do the hard work at the, to make it before the hand? Did you do the business stuff? Like, it, it could work, but you really, if, if you're if you're on your knees saying, God, if this doesn't work well, you're not doing it right. Um, do trust God, though. Um, everybody I've talked to who's a contractor and I'm, I'm no exception. There have been times I'm like, I have no idea uh, how uh, I'm done. This month is it. Like, I'm going to have to go get a job at McDonald's because I have no idea and then something happens, right? Um, this, I love this. I love this. You are more important than the birds on the earth and they're taken care of, right? So, um, <coughs> yes, so much, right? Um, God wants you, God isn't, you know, we're not promised a happy life, you know? But we are we are loved. And that's that's difficult to process. But um, you are more valuable than the birds, right? You're gonna be a success. It's going to happen. It may not be in your own terms, right? But um, this is not in the Bible. <laughs> Definitely forgive. Um, but I have been burned by people I have given my hard hard earned money to. There are people who I have basically like so they so they would not go like live on the streets. I gave them money out of my company to do work for me that I knew probably wouldn't be very good um, because, you know, but like money that I used to pay my mortgage <laughs> and feed my kids. Uh, and then uh, a few months later, they turned on me on, in a very public debacle and basically 
I was just like, wow. Uh, I thought we were tight. I thought I helped you out. That was worth nothing to you, apparently. And now they're coming to me asking me for work. And I'm like, no. You know, like, I mean, I plied about it, but um, I don't get burned again. And I've, I've, I think I've forgiven them. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but just because we are, it is, we are expected and de- it is demanded that we forgive people who have wronged us, does not mean we have to be wronged again and again and again and again. Um, this, is, this is a personal one for me. Um, when you give free work, you devalue your own work and the work of everybody else. When you ask for free work, you devalue the person you're asking that work of. Barter, pay on a payment plan, find some way to give them something in exchange for their work. First of all, it's respect. And first of all, also, like, contractually, they're not, they're loaning it to you. Uh, a contract, since the Magna Carta, has been a thing in exchange of another, right? If they're just giving you for free, you don't really own it. Even they, even they can say, oh, he, he, this is yours. You're like, well. Um, this, is a, this is basically a personal plea. Um, gain agreement with your partners on the definition of success. If you want to be on PewDiePie, but you want to have a, a, a limo that you drive yourself, I don't know, that just came to mind. Um, then you guys are, are far apart. You guys are far apart on your metrics of success, right? If you don't gain agreement on what success looks like, you're going to squabble and fight every step of the way, right? If you can gain agreement on what your motivations are and what your goals look like, then we have to make difficult decisions like do you invest in more servers or do you buy this plugin for Unity or do you go, you know, do you hire a designer? Like that helps you like, but what are our goals? Oh, that's that's where yeah, okay, that makes sense, right? Again, it's really in the good times, before things get tough, figure, figure out as much as you can about who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think that'll help you out a lot. Um, this is amazing, amazing, amazing uh, mm-hmm. advice. When a company is three people, it works one way. At 10 people, everything breaks. HR, payment, insurance, uh, computer systems, my email, everything breaks. 10 to 30, it breaks again. 30 to 100, it breaks again. Like in, in your community size, in their server size, right? So this is just, this is a good rule of thumb. So just as you, as you approach the triple mark of anything in your business, and you start hearing little creaks, little cracks. Like, oh yeah, 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 so it's breaking. That's cool, it's, it's a problem you get to fix, but it's natural. Like, this is just th- the physics of business, basically. Um, I, I moved to San Francisco in 2007. Uh, we spent Christmas in a hotel room. Uh, I missed seeing my son learn how to walk because I was working literally 18 to 20 hours a day with a 45 minute commute. And the game was Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer. Oh. Like, what? Oh, <laughs> Not worth it, right? Um, and I, I'm lucky, like, I, when I got, before I got into games, I had a talk to my wife. I said, there'll be times you won't see me. There'll be times I will not be here. Not bad of choice, just because that's the way it's, it is. And she said, okay, <laughs> excuse me, that, you know, so she knew, right? And that's so big. If she had said no, game development would be a hobby, full stop. Um, learn from postmortems, there are things out there. Free knowledge, guys, scoop it up, suck it up. Um, <laughs> don't, don't have hubris. You're like, no, 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 we got that, 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 that problem we solved. Actually, you see that a lot of times, like, we thought that wouldn't happen to us, and then it did, right? So take advantage of that knowledge. Look for fruit. Uh, this is the, the fig tree uh, thing I was talking about. Um, this, um, this is what, uh, is that what Jesus said? Oh, man, I'm, everything's getting scattered now. Um, so uh, when looking at business partners, when looking at um, accountants, when looking at, uh, game projects or companies, um, you know, does that game come? Are, they, do, are people zombies there? Are they really unhappy? They have sort of glazed look in their eyes. Are they actually like grounded and sincere? Right? Like, 
I think now you you could definitely argue with me on this, but I, I believe this very strongly is that this was not about fruit, right? This is about people, it's about organizations, and if it is withered, if it, if the company is just withered on the vine, there are people just just angry and toxic, don't associate with them. It's not worth it, right? There are healthy alternatives. Um, and I, I take this, I mean, because I've been burned, I think all of us have been burned by toxic people. We may have, may have seen it at a time we just went on just hoping it would work out and it didn't. I think that we've been warned against that. Um, it's just the last, yeah. Uh, there are tons of good and interesting people uh, in the world who have talked about games. In my opinion, these are the two that are the best. Uh, Matt Hall, Cross Your Road, uh, which you're like, what? You know, but seriously, this guy, uh, and Rami Ismail, Vlambeer, um, Nuclear Throne, uh, Reckless Fishing. This guy basically travels the world talking to people about game development and business, and he's been burned a bunch of times, uh, and just is just the kindest, uh, biggest, hardest guy. Everything I have to say, just we did. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so just to close out, um, you know, look. So we're all look. Look around you. If you don't know, you know, five people's names. It's time. It's time to introduce yourself to break out. Don't be an introvert, because um, the, the the biggest thing for me um, in my journey as a, as a business person has been a group called Starbucks. Uh, we started here in Portland, and it's uh, it's peer mentored uh, for founders only, so not for just the people who have it on the line. And when you have people who are like, "Yeah, I, I'm going to lose my house next month if I can't make this thing," and people go, "Okay." You could call this guy or da da da. da. We need to get this loan going. Da da da. da. Like people are just like, yeah, we're, we're in it. We understand. We have the same problems. We have the same victories. We, we share it. It's it's amazing. It's basically a secular church, right? It is it is a community where we don't. It's sometimes confusing and, and, and frustrating, but it's also glorious and amazing. And just take part in that, right? As 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 Christians, I think that we have a better understanding of community than other people. Don't let that just be a thing. Like embrace that, right? Um, and support each other and reach out. Um, and I'm way over time, so my apologies. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, we'll see me in Eugene, maybe, uh, for any game con. And that is it. And we'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Some other time.